and welcome back. Now, there's a lot of components on my desk here today, and uh, we've only got time to talk about one of these. So I was wondering which one we should talk about, because these are some of the things I found in my, my box that have been sitting there for ages, like this, this blue thing here, and that little pack of components over there that's been there for absolutely ages. Or I could talk about why I've had to replace this uh, relay here with this much beefier model here. Um, or we could talk about uh, this little setup with, um, well, basically this one really. This is a, uh, a receiver, FM receiver. Hmm, which one are we going to choose to talk about? We've only got a little bit of time today. So uh, while I consider that, let's have a word from our sponsors first. PCB Way, PCB prototyping the easy way. New users get their first order absolutely free. PCB assembly for up to 10 pieces costs just $88. Check out their website now. Right, I've had a think, and I think we should actually have a go at the FM radio. Now, this was uh, suggested to me by a, a viewer. A viewer, is that right? Is that the right word for YouTube? A viewer, yes. Um, who said, I've looked at your MP3 uh, module video that you did a while ago. That's, that's the one on screen now. He says, have you got one for FM radio? And I thought, you know what? I've never done an FM radio module before. How difficult can it be? And the answer is not. It's not difficult. So here we have a TEA5767 module that plugs into an Arduino via I squared C. And well, OK, the components on here we'll talk about in a minute. They're, they're extra to what you would normally need. Um, but let's have a look at this this FM radio then and just see how easy it would be. Now one of the reasons I've chosen this for this this week's video is because this could lend itself very very well to people who like to explore the Arduino a bit further and perhaps attach more than one module but can do it in a a in a structured manner right going forward so you don't try and build the whole of NASA in your bedroom in one go, you could start off with this in the way that I've done it, as sort of a proof of concept, and then you could um, add a few more bits. Let's discuss that once I've cleared the decks, all right? Right, the decks are cleared, and all we've got is this little tiny TEA5767 module connected to the Arduino on the I squared C bus, so two wires, and of course power. Power, now there's the thing. The reason why I've got some of these components over here, forget all these over here, that's from a previous project, um, basically a resistor, capacitor and a couple of wires, is because the power from the Arduino is very noisy. Or at least as far as this module is concerned, it's very noisy. So all I've done is uh, smoothed it out on here, cleaned it up basically, before supplying the voltage to here. Now this is fairly uh, relaxed about the sort of voltage it receives. I think it's 2.9 to 5.5. We'll check that on the data sheet in a minute, but uh, it's around that. So you can supply it directly with the 5 volts in the Arduino, but uh, having smoothed it here, I think it gets something like 4 volts, and it's very happy with that, and it works very nicely. So I think the first thing we'll do is show you how it works and how it tunes through things so you can see it working. Um, just one little caveat here. As you know, YouTube stroke Google are very, very hot on copyright infringement, and if they detect any current pop music or well, any pop music current or not in your video they will come down on you well me like a ton of bricks and take away all the monetization of that video uh, forever and a day so what i've got to be very careful is, is as we tune through the radio stations if we hit like a pop station which we will um, it's got to be brief quick and um, i might have to accidentally um, disconnect the speaker just for those couple of seconds all right just we don't want this uh, this video uh, going wrong now we've got this far. Right, first of all, let me connect up the output then. So as you can see here, there's there's two sockets, two 3.5 mil jacks. One's for the aerial, that one there, and I'll extend that out to get a good signal. And the other one is either for headphones, it works well just with headphones, or I've got a pair of PC speakers over on the other side of the desk there with a long extension cable. So I'm going to plug that in there and turn it on, and then we'll be right back. Right, I'm going to plug in the headphone socket now, which will immediately, of course, start... Uh, listening to the radio that it's tuned into. Um, but what I'm going to do is then reset the Arduino so that it starts cycling through a number of stations that I've um, found, and we'll see how that works on the IDE. Now, nothing is going to happen here whilst we're tuning. Nothing, no lights come on. In fact, well, it's all a bit boring, really. So if we switch over to the code window, 
um, you'll see some stuff come up on the debug window or the serial monitor over here and uh, you'll see what's how it tunes all these radio stations here these ones which are British FM stations uh, some are pop some are just talking and the final one that we tune to is in fact BBC Radio 4 and I'm hoping they're a bit more relaxed about any sort of copyright infringement because after all we're not listening to the program we're just proving that this receiver works so we'll plug it in so what we can do actually is put the um, always orange, almost always I'm going to put the serial monitor on that was originally to now and it will reset itself there it goes so 90.8 103.3 104.5 that's 93 that's radio 4 another one oh dear sort of wrapper and 93 again oh, and again what we call a sharp cheddar oh yes that's it the final one it just tunes around forever on 93 Great. So what you've seen there then, and it does actually tune to each of these frequencies as it goes whizzing through and, and works very well. I can tell you now that the quality of the sound is in fact very pleasant. Um, it's not, you know, top notch hi-fi, but then again, it's FM. It's never going to be top notch hi-fi, but it is very listenable. It's got a nice um, frequent response. You know, it's not tinny. Well, not on the speakers I've got anyway. So I'm guessing that this issues a decent frequency response, you know, nice and flat from 30 to 12,000 maybe. We'll have a look at the specs for that as well. So let's have a look then how easy it is to actually get this thing coded. So I'm going to take off the, um, the desktop and we'll talk through this very, very simple bit of code and then look about um, where I got this item from. And it really is a nice thing to use and I'll talk about that in a little bit later. Right, so this is just... Uh, most of this, incidentally, is comments. In fact, I'm going to switch that off as well, so it's distracting, isn't it? Right, OK, let's stop that bit. So let's have a look at the code, because this module can do a number of things. It can either tune to a specific frequency that you tell it to, or it can search up or down the standard FM band for where you live. Now, by standard, that means 100 and, 108 is the top end for both Japan and Europe, I believe. But Europe starts around about 88, and Japan starts at something like 77. So you can switch it, you can tell it which bands to listen to, all via I squared C. And there's only five bytes of data that go back and forward on the I squared C bus for this. So if we just whiz through the code, um, I can give you more detail both in the GitHub um, and below this video in the video description down there. All right. And uh, well, once you've got this working, or take my demo code, it's it's child's play to get the thing working properly. Right, let's uh, scroll down there. So what we're doing, we're, I've got this list of stations that I've discovered, if you like, okay, in the UK, more where I live. Um, mainly, no, they're not mainly BBC at all. There's two or three BBC in there and a couple of commercial stations, but the signal is nice and strong, and this little tiny aerial... Um, manages very well actually it's a telescope area you can't see it all there but it's you know a standard telescope area about well not even a foot long it's probably about um what nine inches maybe something like that yeah so that's it's it picks it up even on that so what do we do then so the setup does nothing apart from allow us to debug the code um here's our buffer that we're sending from the arduino to the module okay and um this mem set simply sets that memory, the buffer, to zero for five bytes. That's a built-in Arduino, or is it C++? Well, it's one or the other. Used it a lot. Now, the, um, the one anomaly about this particular radio module is that it can inject the local oscillator value at high or low. What does that all mean, Ralph? Well, basically, it means this. We'll do a little experiment, shall we? Let's assume that you have a, a, a station transmitting at exactly 100 megahertz. For an order for an FM receiver, well, this one specifically to demodulate that, it has to inject a local frequency on the board at um, just either just under 100 megahertz or just over 100 megahertz, so that the difference in frequency is back down into the realms where we can start demodulating it and hearing it. Now, if you're thinking, how does that work? Let's do a little experiment, and I think it will make it very clear 
um, how this hangs together. Imagine that I was whistling a single tone like this. Right, I'm actually going to whistle. And let's say for argument's sake that was one kilohertz, right? Whether it is or not is not, not relevant. If I whistle again, but just slightly off that one kilohertz, you don't just hear the one kilohertz and the 110 kilohertz, a hertz. You hear the sum and the difference of those two frequencies. So you hear the one, did I say 100? I've got to do this again now. I? So you would hear the one kilohertz signal, that's the original one. You'd hear the uh, one kilohertz and 10 hertz as a separate signal. And then the, the two joined together, so like a two kilohertz sound, and then the difference, one subtracted from the other, which would be, in this case, 10 hertz, which is a bit low, actually, you can't hear that. But you get the idea. Let's do an experiment. I don't know if these are going to work on video, but I've got here a, um, a trusty recorder, and I've whistled into this at about one kilohertz. It doesn't matter what the frequency is. So if we play this, so if we listen to this, I'll put it up to the mic so you can hear it. Okay, you get the idea. All right, that's enough. Stop. Right, so that's that's pretty much, you know, a single tone. Now, if I whistle alongside that, listen very carefully. You're going to hear more than just two tones. You're going to hear a very discordant sound. Listen to this. Now, I hope you got that. I could certainly hear it here, and I hope it came out on the microphone. You're hearing the sum and the difference. Let me write this down on a board. And we'll, I think it will make more sense then. So what we've got here then is the standard one kilohertz tone that you heard first, then me whistling alongside it at a subtly different frequency. Okay, you could really tell the difference. But what you can get then, and what you do get, is frequency A plus frequency B, so you get a two kilohertz tone not what you want. What you actually want is the first frequency A minus the second frequency B. That gives us this 0.01 kilohertz frequency. Now, as I say, that was probably a bad example. It would be better if this had been a bit higher because then it would have been in the audio realm. And that's how you get demodulated FM back into audio. It's a bit more complex overall than that, but that is generally how it works. And this is what we mean by injecting the local oscillator B against the main frequency that you're trying to resolve, A, do you inject this higher, as this is a little bit higher, or do you inject it subtly lower, so it's like 0.95 or something like that. Okay, back to the code. So this is what we mean by high-low here um, on this line 41. Do we inject that local oscillator generated by this, by this device at a higher frequency or lower frequency than the one we want to get. Now, funnily enough, I read about this, and uh, it says mainly we tend to go higher. Unfortunately, that that wasn't the case with any of my experiments. Um, we actually go lower. If I tried it higher, the results were very, very poor. You sort of hear something, but it wasn't right. So we're setting this to zero, which means go lower. Okay. Um, and then we're just saying, here's the frequency I want to go and get. Um, calculate some of the bytes we'll go into this in a little bit more detail but it's not important at this stage put all these into the five bytes from the arduino and uh, then send it down the wire and lo and behold the little unit picks it up rather nicely now as you might expect with i squared c there's a bit of well faffing about with those five bytes Luckily, the last byte, just for experimental purposes, in this one, this demo, you don't have to worry about at all. So that brings it down to four. The third byte is the most interesting one in where you can set various options, like do I want to force it to mono or do I want stereo? Do I want um, noise reduction mode on and things like this? So that's pretty easy to do. It's just one bit. It's like a flag, an on-off switch in that byte. Okay, Each bit within the byte is a flag of some sort. And it's bytes one and two that have the frequency sent down. Now, unfortunately, the data sheet does explain how to do this, but not quite in enough detail. So I've actually documented this here um, in some detail. So if we go here, reading from line 74 onwards, 
um, it explains how to get the frequency into those two bytes, which is basically you go put it through this ridiculous um, formula here. So high low is not one, it's zero in this case for the UK. If anybody in the UK incidentally ever builds this, um, I'll be interested to know if, if the high low should ever be one where you live. Maybe it's um, a side effect of the particular transmitter of where you are. Don't know. Anyway, this is the frequency. This is the sorry, not the frequency. This is the formula that uh, we use and supplied by the data sheet to find those those values to stuff into those bytes and just just follow what I've done here. And it's it's child's play. Now. That's all well and good, and okay, we've proven that this device works and tunes into the frequencies that we've specified, and what I haven't shown you here is the ability to search up and down, because that's that requires a bit more um, code, and I wanted to keep the code very simple. It's still very simple in as much that you say, Oi, module, I want you to search up, please, and stop when you get the signal, um, which it will do, but of course if it doesn't lock onto a signal, and it hits the 108 megahertz, it then comes back to you without a signal and says, I've hit the end of the band, now what? Okay, so there's this little bit of code, you just have to tell it a bit more, and I didn't want to pollute, if you like, the simplicity of the code that we've got here with that sort of logic. But it is easy, and I'll, I'll include um, a demo file that I found. Now, you might think this is all a bit much for me. I can't work out you know, all these bits and bytes and setting flags and I just, I, can't we use a library? Yes, we can. And luckily enough, I've found one, okay? Um, I've, I've had, how can I say this? I don't wanna say I've made corrections. Well, all right, I've made a couple of corrections to the library because it just wasn't quite spot on, wasn't quite working for me. And the demo sketch that came with it definitely didn't work for me. I've had to um, change that as well. But now that I've got them working, they work as well as you might expect for a demo sketch. Okay, it can search and it can go to a particular frequency and that's fine. So if you don't want all the faffing about with these bits and bytes and whatnot, then use the library by all means, except just remember though that you're not in total control then. If you think, no, I want to, I want to be able to force it to mono by myself, there's no mechanism within that library to say set to mono. You'd have to write that. And if you understand the sketch that's on the screen now, you could write your own library. Believe me, it is not difficult for this. I mean, there's only five bytes, well, four really. Five tops though, bytes in which you've got to set. It's just not that difficult. And you can do everything you want then. Okay, you can do the, the noise cancelling bit. You can set it to mono. You can suppress one of the channels or the other. There's, there's everything you need to do with this module you can do just by writing your own little library. As I say, if you don't want to do that, use the one that I've found and I'll put up on the GitHub for you. Now, why else then did I think that this particular module was worthy of a beginner's attention? If you're somebody who likes to experiment with the Arduino and think, now putting a radio on the end of my Arduino could be, you know, better fun really. Get a nice speaker, you could use an LM386 power amplifier to drive um, a couple of speakers. I'll show you a, a kit that um, Banggood does if that because to make it easy because it uses a, a transparent case and two speakers and it all comes together. Um, it'll be nice to do that but what's more exciting is the bits you can add around this that will really really show you how to use some of the modules that we've used in the past. Let me draw a couple of pictures. So here we are then, we have a TEA5767 module, as we've just described, connected to an Arduino right, via the I squared C bus. So you, if you don't want to muck about with the I squared C bus yourself, we'll use the library. But however, we've got the I squared C bit running there anyway, right? Now, what else would you need on a radio to make it useful? Well, one, you'll need some kind of amplifier, unless you're just going to put in earphones, which you can do initially, of course, while you're getting the thing running. So you need an amp from the output. Um, ideally stereo because after all at the end of the day this is a stereo device uh, those funny squiggles are supposed to be landscapers speakers right there we are so all right so you've, you've got an amp an lm386 or anything you like okay what else could teach you a bit though about the uno and what to do with it well the first thing of course that this would need or could benefit from let's put it that way is some kind of indication of which frequency you're on 
So would a TFT um, screen of some kind be useful? Well, yes, it would. The TFT screen, of course, will display the frequency. Now, you're going to drive that uh, from the UNO, but guess what? It's driven normally by an I2C bus. So, you know, you've got two things hanging in the I2C bus. Um, the TFT stuff we've covered many times. Um, that video on screen is probably a good place to start to look at how to use that. But even if you start just by displaying the frequency, um, then once you've got that working, you think about putting it into big fonts, which is also covered on that uh, video there. That means, though, to get that frequency, you're reading the data from here up the I2C channel into the UNO. The UNO's doing whatever it needs to do and then sending out um, a message onto the TFT. So that's the first thing you could get working very nicely. How do you tune this then? Yes, you've got to send the command down from the UNO, either to a preset station, or you can say tune up, search up, or search down. And if you hit the end of the band, loop around either way. So if you're searching down the band and you get to 108 and it still hasn't found something, then reset that frequency back to 98 point whatever it is, or 97 probably, something that's the beginning of the band, and carry on searching that way. Well, you can do all that, but what are you going to press to make it do it? Well, you could have a, a switch or two to say search up, search down. So those switches could be in here and that could invoke something on the Uno. Or how about this for a, an idea? Rather than using the search function on here, you could use, instead of um, a potentiometer, we could use a rotary encoder, a rotary ink. Now, I've done a video on this and all it does is tell the Uno via interrupts which way you're turning a knob right so there's some kind of tuning knob here with an arrow on it as you turn it this direction the uno will know that you're turning it in an anti-clockwise direction and if you're turning it that way the uno will know you're turning it that way and with a tiny little piece of logic you can say increment the current frequency by 100 kilohertz and send that down the wire and see what you found and every time you turn it that way it'll just keep incrementing the frequency the current frequency on here by 100k until something tunes in right and of course while you're doing all this it's displaying the frequency on the tft i'm hoping now you're getting the idea that this could be a building block for people who want to know about the uno in a really practical fashion this is what triggered really my interest in this to begin with I thought this could really be something you could do it in different ways now if you don't like the idea of a rotary encoder then you could of course just go with two buttons search up search down that gives you a little different bit of code here instead of sending down a specific frequency you actually send down a search command and then you have to listen for the response to say i've found something which may or may not be a radio station it's just noise sometimes but um, it will say here's a frequency or it will say i've run off the end of the band and then you have to have the logic inside the uno to do something else Let's put it this way. I'm so convinced that this is the sort of thing that could really teach people about the UNO. If I was running a class of pupils, say, um, you know, high school kids or something, or adults, this could be a, a building block for the entire term's um, education on, on microcontrollers because there's so much here you could do. What about um, signal strength? You can interrogate this for signal strength. When this comes up with signal strength, you could, of course, just display it in here as a number. So it's a maximum number of uh, 15 that it comes back as so it's the signal strength out of 15 do you just want to put 12 on here it's not exactly meaningful is it what you really want to put on here is some kind of graduated display let's um let's do it left to right because that would be easier so you could have a a filled in bar down here with the frequency um, the signal level input on that or why not go the whole hog and use um, neopixels you can have a stick of neopixels multicolored connected to the uno all done serially and the and the level of the signal will make the leds go up the stick or further down and you can have different colors depending on whether it's mono stereo or just have it modulated to the beat of the music if you really wanted there are so many options here that i think it's really worth um, considering this for people who want to know about uno coding and how how you can get these sort of almost like lego blocks in themselves, they're just sitting passive, waiting for something to happen. But once you plug them in with a bit of glue in the middle called coding, then all these things make sense and can really turn this, this collection, motley collection of modules into a very nice little project. And yes, of course, you can go down the Diamond 10 store and buy an FM radio for something like £10, $10. But that's not the point, is it? The point is, 
by doing this, you're learning all these techniques on how to use an UNO, whether it's I squared C, serial, interrupts, I C squared again, probably interrupts here, possibly. You're learning all this that could really set you up going forward in techniques on how to use the Arduino. Yeah, I know. I'm I'm going on a bit now. I'll stop. Um, yeah, let's let's have a look where I got this from, how much it might be, to see whether you're interested. Right, so this is where I got it from. I got it from Banggood, five pound thirty. You can get it from just about anywhere. This particular module. Um, now, the reason that I often buy stuff from Banggood because it's quick to arrive. Some places take, you know, three four weeks. In fact, I've just had some stuff delivered. I think it was before Christmas. It took two months to arrive from. I believe it was Vietnam or Taiwan. Taiwan it was, which is too long, far too long. But Banggood is normally pretty quick, which is why I tend to use them a lot because they're sort of within a couple of weeks. I'll be disappointed if it didn't turn up in two weeks, let's put it that way. Um, but the prices may be a little bit higher. Maybe they're using a better postal service, I don't know. Anyway, it's £5.30 this one. Uh, if you buy more than one, you get a discount, of course. Um, what else does it show? It shows you the module. I mean, there's, there's nothing particularly fancy about it. This chip, incidentally, has been around for a little while. Um, if we look at the data sheet for this chip, you can see it says here, look, revision 5. 26th of January 2007. I mean, that's, or well, January, so that's now what, um, 12 years ago, isn't it? 12 years it's been around. Now, this is the data sheet, though, for the tiny little chip. If I go back to the desktop just to show you what I mean, on, on this module board, you can just about make out there's this little tiny square here that's been soldered on to this main board. It's this little tiny square that we're talking about in this data sheet, right? If you were to get this little square module all by itself, which is just a chip and an oscillator and probably a couple of capacitors on there, that would be, I suspect, hard work to put together. But on this board done like this, it's an awful lot easier. Yes, this chip does implement I squared C natively. There's nothing on here that does that. Um, don't know what that one that looks like. A, no, it's not a voltage regulator. It doesn't matter. Let's not get it bogged down in the details. Um, it's easier, though, to use a little module like this, in my humble opinion, than trying to go just for that little tiny square, which is what we're talking about on the, the data sheet. Not that one. That one there. Okay. So, but all the, I mean, obviously, because we're using the actual module, um, all this um, is correct, what we're looking at here. So here it talks about the... Um, Europe and US, which is 87.5 to 108, and Japan 76 to 91. Oh, 91. I thought Japan went higher. Okay. So if you're in Japan or in that part of the world, you can change it just by sending down a different value as part of those five bytes. It's just one bit in one byte, probably byte three, actually. Um, yeah, and I'll let you read this at your leisure, but it does give you some nice features. It is a fully fledged FM tuner all the things you would expect from that. Incidentally, if you, if you get that module as is, as shown on screen there, and plug it into your 5 volt supply, and plug your aerial in and your earphones, you'll hear zilcho. Because what happens is, on power up, and in the absence of any other data, it, the device is muted and sits there waiting for a command. Okay, so don't think it's broken if you buy one and do that to check it out. You must send something down the I squared C and say, use my, use my demo sketch. It's only a few lines of code and it'll prove that it's working. I guess that's uh, all we've got time for today. I'm, I'm, I'm really keen though that um, this is expanded. I might um, fiddle about in future videos and put a, an LED or LCD screen on here just to display the frequency perhaps. No promises. And uh, oh yes, all these components here, I say all these, one resistor, one capacitor, forget all these, the, the bits hidden by my hand are not part of this. Um, this is simply a little tiny smoothing cleaning of the power. There are, there's a picture of the circuit diagram for that little bit there, and as you can see, it's two components. But boy, what a difference it makes to the sound quality on here. If you, com if you plug this directly into the 5 volts, or the 3.3 volts, this is noisy, it's, it really does interfere with the sound. Put it through that, perfect, as perfect as you can get anyway. Um, the other thing, uh, you notice at the back there, I'm actually running on a separate power supply. 
And this cable plugged in here is only a data cable. Um, you can just see at the back there, look, right at the back, um, the power, the red wire, is disconnected. I've cut that so the power is not being supplied by USB. Because if you think this is noisy, USB is 10 times noisier still. And there's so much rubbish on this line going up and down. For something like a radio, it makes such a huge difference not to have that. Anyway, that was just a, a heads up, really, in case you're going down that route. Cool. OK, I think that uh, brings this to a close. If you've got any ideas about what else we could attach to this, please, please do put them in the comments, because I know that this channel is watched by a number of foreign schools, um, teachers and students uh, watch this to learn a bit more about Arduinos. And that's why I'm sort of pushing the educational side of this. It's not just so we can listen to a bit of pop music. It's that we can actually devise some real sketches in here and learn how the Arduino works. And this is a nice way of doing it. Because as soon as you've built this and got this working, then you can be listening to that music while you're building all the rest. And you can build it in a very structured manner, bit by bit, and get it all working one bit at a time. Cool. OK, we'll leave it there. Thanks very much for watching. Don't forget to leave your comments down below. Put suggestions in for other things we can connect to this radio. Well, the Arduino, really, but radio related. And uh, I'll see you in the next video. I hope you're finding these videos useful and interesting. There are plenty more videos to choose and a couple are shown below. And if you'd like to subscribe to this channel, just click on my picture below and enjoy the rest of the videos. Thanks for watching.